If you all hear beautiful souls, yay. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Oh, there's Daniel. Okay, well, I will not be distracted by people coming in. Um, I just wanna know how excited I am that we all made it and we decided to be here today, today, now. And for this, book reading event uh, in community of chapter seven, the a man on a mission. And I just want everyone to have take a take a moment and have a look at who you're keeping company with. Everyone who's in this space right now. Just have a send them a blessing. I'm gonna send a blessing everyone's way. And, and love to all of you and namaste and blessings, blessings, blessings all around. Yeah. So, uh, and just out of curiosity, because I, I, I'm curious, where is everyone from? I know this is a global community. Is where, please put in the chat where you are currently calling, tuning in from. We got Serbia, Iowa, South Florida, and I'm in Vancouver, Canada, Utah, California, Michigan. I think it's like like early early morning for some people there and it's evening here, but we're kind of a timeless space here. So that's what I love about this. And so so yeah, welcome, 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 welcome. And I'm really excited because this is the first time I get to do this. So I'm I'm the welcoming committee. Um and I will not be distracted by people coming in. Um, okay, so so let's get going. So um, I just would love to take a moment to acknowledge the amazing, amazing Amy Hardison for birthing, taking two years to birth the book of being. She took two years of her life and blood, sweat, and everything writing writing the book of being for us, about us. So I really wanna acknowledge her, the ultimate author. And I also would love to acknowledge Alan, Alan D. Thompson, Dr. Alan D. Thompson for listening to the call, the nudge from God to write, to, to research and write uh, gift 600 and 22 pages and answering that nudge and taking action. So acknowledging kudos to Alan D. Thompson. Thank you. And just for all their commitment and dedication, because that's that's real commitment. And last but not least, I want to acknowledge. We want to acknowledge Steve Hardison, uh, the angel of fire, uh, the sole orthodontist, or the ultimate coach. So um, Steve, uh, Scott, you might know him as, he, goes, he might go by some other name, but um, anyways, we know him that as, some, as an example of being, um, an example for all of us, for all of humanity, and uh, using all his gifts, including talking the birds out of the trees and uh, so he can love humanity, love up 
humanity. So acknowledgements to Steve, eternally grateful for you. And this is the most important uh, acknowledgement is to acknowledge you, each and every one of you for being here today and choosing to spend this time dedicated to your expansion. And we value your presence and it, it really makes this reading super powerful, your presence. So we appreciate you being here. And so we're gonna take a, a deeper look, a deep dive into chapter seven, A Man on a Mission. And we, I, we, we welcome Scott Parker, Scott Parker. Um, and thank him for saying yes to reading for us and telling us all about Steve's, uh, his, everything that, that went out on during those, those mission days, early days. And we, we thank you for being here, Scott. It's, it's amazing you're here with us today. So we also ask you to keep uh, the integrity of the sacred space, um, that it's a sacred safe, space for sharing your insights about you and the chapter. So um, we also ask that if you want to acknowledge someone in the group to please do it at another time and place. And if you, if you, um, it's also a gentle reminder uh, that this is not the time or place for self-promotion. So the the reason why we're here today, and so you will get the most value uh, for you, is uh, we, we invite you to, uh, when you read, read about you. And when you listen, listen about you. And when you share, share about you. And thank you for listening. Thank you for being here. And I over to my co-lead, Ken. Where are you, Ken? Thank you, my dear Andrea. Well, 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 how you gave a fantastic welcoming and making everybody feel warm here tonight. Great job. I just want to acknowledge you. So great, great job. Um, I'm going to start things off a little bit different tonight, and I, I'm feeling called that I need to do this. So before we begin our readings tonight, before we begin our journey tonight, I'm asking, let's take a pause, a sacred moment of reflection. Let us in these precious moments together delve deep into the understanding of the turmoil that engulfs the world around us. Ooh, yes. We are all created in the image of God and a pen embodiment of pure love. It is our shared calling to pray, to meditate, or to engage in whatever your heart urges you to do, that we may come to experience a profound love for all of humanity. Let us unite in the soulful quest to foster love for our fellow human beings instead of perpetuating destruction among one another. So can I ask us to take a few moments now? Thank you, all of you, for taking these beautiful moments with me and sharing this with me, sending out love to each and every one of you. So now let's begin. To all of you beautiful souls, hello, and welcome to another exciting gathering of being. Of course, I'd like to give another shout out to our main man tonight, Mr. Scott Parker, our guest reader. 
We're thrilled to have you here tonight, Scott. And I just want to say, having you come into the room before we started and got to share an actual live rendition of you and Steve when you were growing up, when you were on the mission, not only just to read about it, but actually get to physically see you and talk about it. It actually put me there when you were talking about it. So thank you for sharing that with us. Now, I got a request for all of us here. If you happen to have a physical copy of the book, The Ultimate Coach, that we're gonna to explore today, let's see it now. Show off that book in style. Because this is a tangible connection to the wisdom we're about to dive into. So come on, let's get excited about this. This is why we're here tonight. We're here because of this. Let me see it, let me see it all wave. There we go. I want it all up there. Let's get, let's get physical right here. Let's start making that connection. Awesome. Thank you everyone for sharing that with me. And those who are joining us for the first time from the bottom of my heart, from the bottom of Team Tuck, we welcome each and every single one of you. So I wanna ask you this question. If this is your first voyage with us, please raise your electronic hand so we can see that it's your who's here for the first time. And you'll find the electronic hand at the bottom of your Zoom screen there and look under reactions, click on that tab and then click on raise your hand. Can I see who's been here for the very first time tonight? Becky, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Let me just flip over to the next page. Anybody else here for the first time? Awesome. Well, Becky, welcome. And who is this? Uh, I see, I see iPhone Tanja. iPhone Tanja for the first time. Tanja, are you capable of uh, putting your uh, camera on so we can see your beautiful face? All right. Well, when you get an opportunity, Tanja, if you can come on, we would love, oh, there you are. Okay, welcome Tanja. Thank you so much. And I hope, I pray that I'm saying your name correctly. Hi, welcome. Welcome our two new souls. Welcome to our two beautiful, beautiful people tonight, to Becky and to Tanja. Thank you for being here tonight. So joining our community, this is your community as well. Even though it's your first time, this community belongs to you. And we want you to know, Becky and Tanja, that your presence here adds immeasurable value to this reading experience. So I'm gonna ask Becky and Tanja to do me one more favor. If you had the book handy, could you hold it up for me once more time? Tanja, if you can hear me, if you have the book. Becky and Tanja, I would like you to do this for me. I would like you to hold the book. You don't have the book? You're on mute, dear. You're on mute. I don't have a physical book. I just have the, have it on Audible. Okay. So, Tanja, listening to this book, and Becky, holding this book in your hand, I want you to take a few moments for me right now. And I really want you to sit with the book. And don't say nothing. And what you remember listening to, Tanja, just take a few moments for me and just be with the book for right now. Be with the book of being. Thank you. So I asked you to do that for a reason. I wanna let you know that both of you, you are both in a safe place. I want you to know there is no judgment present with any of us here tonight. We are love and each of us gives you our entire love. So with that being said, 
knowing that this is a safe place, that what's said in here stays in here between all of us here, I'm going to ask you, Becky and San Tanja, would you be willing to be our first two readers tonight? Sure. Okay, Becky. Becky, would you be willing to read the back of the book first? Not yet. Hang on. Okay. Tanja, Tanja, would you be willing to read? Oh, you got the you got the you got the uh, audio book on that. Okay. With that being said, is there anybody else that would be willing to go ahead and read the very first two pages of the book after Becky reads it? Just put up your electronic hand so I could see. All Carol, right, Carol. Uh, all right, Carol. Thank you so so much for volunteering. And of course, we have our main reader tonight, Scott Parker, who's going to be reading on uh, Chapter Seven, "A Man on a Mission." So this is how we're going to flow with this. Becky, I'm going to ask you to read the back of the book first, and then when you're finished, Carol, you're just going to jump right in and you're going to read the first two pages. And then after Carol's done, Scott. I would ask you to just go ahead and go ahead and begin reading your chapter. Okay, is there any questions before we move on? No. Nope. Okay, so now let's make this reading session memorable and let's dive into this journey of self-discovery together. Now I'm asking all of you, all of you who are present on this call tonight, as you listen to the readers delve into the questions at the back in the front of the book and as Scott reads the chapter man on a mission, listen intently, listen for yourself. As Steve always says, if you heard it before, great. Listen again as if you are hearing it for the very first time. Make a commitment to learning something new. And I ask you, as you are listening, if a particular question resonates with you, don't hesitate to write it down. It might be a question you want to explore further during this book reading tonight. And as a gentle reminder, during the sharing time, focus on yourself. When it's your turn to share, make it all about you. All right, with that being said, let's get this party started. So Becky, it'll be you, Carol, it'll be you, and then it will be Scott. Thank you. Who would I need to be to be a more loving person? Who would I need to be to be a more effective parent? Who would I need to be to create a level of confidence that is remarkable? Who would I need to be to be at peace with who I am? Who would I need to be to be fully in love with myself and my life? Who would I need to be to live the most extraordinary life I can live? Shall I go on, Ken? I promise you that if you read this book with the intention of expanding your state of being, you'll be exactly that. Your experience will be remarkable. Who you are being is everything. Loving you, Steve Hardison. I never wanted to write a book, and I haven't. I never wanted to have a book written about me, but here it is. This book is a gift for my wife, Amy, who wrote it, and my friend, Alan D. Thompson who conducted the research and interviews on which it is based. And it's not just a gift to me, but to you too. And now you're reading it. So with your permission, I'll give you some suggestions on how to read it. You see, this isn't an ordinary book. It's not simply a biography. It's not a self-help book. It's not a literary classic. It definitely, it's definitely not a book about how to coach. In fact, it's not a book about doing anything. It is a book about being, and it's a book about you. To access this book, ask yourself these questions as you read. Who am I being as a partner, parent, or friend? 
Who am I being as a leader? Who am I being as a member of my community? Who would I need to be to have miracles show up in my daily life? And who would I need to be to create value in the work I do? Who would I need to be to generate a life of abundance? Who would I need to be to alter my relationship with fear? Who would I need to be to be at peace with my past? Who would I need to be to step powerfully into my future? Who would I need to be to be present as a way of being? Who would I need to be to live the most extraordinary life I can live? Who would I need to be to know that my life makes a difference? Who would I need to be to be fully in love with myself and my life? Who would I need to be to improve my relationships with the most important people in my life? Who would I need to be to read The Ultimate Coach and have a personal breakthrough in being wonderful me? The best part about this book? This book is about you, is that it is endless. The story goes on and it's written by your being. Loving you. Be blessed, be you, Steve Hardison. Ready? Okay, first of all, I wanna say, uh, and I started to say this in our kind of our pre-meeting, Amy, I think has toned down a little bit of what it's like to be a missionary and especially a missionary like Steve Hardison. Um, for those of you that don't know, this is Steve and I met when he was 20 years old. I was 19 years old. I believe it was August uh, 29th or 30th of 1975. Uh, I had just arrived in England and I was in my very first area with my very first missionary companion. And Steve was what was called my district leader. There were about five or six companionships in this district and Steve was the leader he was the district leader of our district and that's how I met Steve now just to give you an idea I want to I want to go forward just a little bit before I start reading I want to just give you an idea of what Steve was like he was incredibly powerful he was incredibly articulate he was really hardworking. he was very effective and he was fun and he was funny at the same time. Now, not everybody can do that. Not everybody can be all those things. One of the first times I knocked on doors with Steve, I had been, at, I was out about six months. Our paths crossed again. And I, now I was a district leader and Steve was my zone leader. A zone has several districts in it. And uh, I was working with him. The very first time I worked with him. Now, Steve was kind of a legend in our, in our mission. And so I was kind of nervous to work with Steve Hardison and to go out and knock on doors and make presentations and speak to people. I I was nervous about it. I didn't know how how that would be. I didn't know how he would look at me and how effective I would be. I I I was I remember thinking, you know, this is this is kind of the big leagues now with him. So we went up to the first door that we um knocked on. And uh, you could hear the lady coming. It was, you know, probably 10 o'clock in the morning. And you could hear the lady in the house. And these were modest little row houses that we were calling on in the suburb of London. And um, here she comes. And uh, she's probably about three, three seconds, four seconds from opening the door. And Steve looked at me and said, this is your door. And then... He let out the biggest fart in the world. And I just started laughing. And the woman opened the door. And Steve is the straight man now. And I'm laughing. And she's looking at me like I'm crazy. Because all I'm doing is laughing. Nobody's saying anything. <laughs> and and uh, she just looked at us and just in disgust, just slammed the door. And Steve looked at me. And he said, you got to have some fun out here. <laughs> and so 
that's how my working experience with Steve started. So, okay. So let me let me start chapter seven. A man on a mission. Missions are an oh, the other thing I was gonna say. No matter I I I'm I this probably doesn't need to be said, but I'm gonna say it anyway. Um Whatever feeling you have about the LDS church or the Mormon religion, just set it aside and just listen to what happened. Because um, I think I don't want anybody to cloud that up with, with what this chapter is about, because this is about a, our, our work as missionaries. And uh, what we were doing is trying to convince people to join the Mormon church at this time in our life. So, okay. Missions are an integral part of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. They have their own language and culture. Without a brief explanation, Steve's mission experience would be agnomatic to all but the members of his church. Young men of good standing in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints are expected to serve a mission when they are 18. At the time we went, it was 19. Saints are expected to serve a mission when they are 18. Girls Girls can serve a mission, but that, that's optional. Missionaries do not choose where they go. They receive a letter, now an email, that tells them where they have been called to serve. Often they need a new, they have to learn a new language. They serve for two years. They are not paid for their work. They pay their own living expenses. A missionary leaves his young adult life behind. At the time C Steve served his mission, a missionary communicated with his family only by letter. He could only call home only on Christmas and Mother's Day. A missionary does not date. He doesn't watch television. He doesn't return home for weddings or funerals. He is always with his companion, another missionary who he's assigned to be his co-worker. These two missionaries form what is called a companionship. They work together, study together, eat together, and they live in the same apartment. Missions are divided into ge geographic areas. The smallest uh, is called an area. It is a place where a mission missionary is assigned to live and work. Several of these areas make a district. Several districts constitute a zone. Several zones create a mission. In a companionship, one missionary is the senior missionary. Missionary companionships that are particularly effective, obedient, and hardworking will serve will serve in leadership capacities as district leaders and zone leaders. The top missionaries of the mission serve as assistants to the president. Mission presidents are men who are called to serve for three years without pay to oversee the mission. A mission president is accompanied by his wife and children if they happen to have children under the age of 18. They are the only adults provided supervision for the approximately 200 missionaries in their mission. The mission president assigns missionary companionships. Typically, he will change the companionships every six or 12 weeks, though there are exceptions. A missionary's objective is to teach the principles and precepts of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Those who accept these teachings join the faith through baptism. Baptism is performed by those who are eight years old or older. Performed for those who are eight years old or older. Missionaries may provide support in helping a family transition into involvement in the church, but with baptism, their primary responsibility is complete. Within the church's belief system, there is still one more step. They believe families will continue to exist in heaven. For this to happen, they must receive sacred ordinances in the temple. This is the pinnacle of their faith. Steve had been checking the mailbox daily. Finally, the oversized white envelope with the words, The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in the upper left corner arrived. He didn't wait to gather family or friends. He went straight to Grandma Ellen, and together they opened the letter that would chart the next two years of Steve's life. He read the words, You are hereby called to be a missionary to labor in the England-London South Mission. You are scheduled to enter the mission home in Salt Lake City on Saturday 12 October 1974. We ask that you please send your written acceptance promptly. Steve's first thought was, I'm teaching the Beatles. I'm teaching the Queen. Steve's first visit was to Brother Fraser, whose wake-up call had set Steve on a path that few would have predicted. Steve's pace on that path was about to hit mock speed.
Three months later, Steve landed in Heathrow Airport. He was eager to plunge into one of the greatest experiences of, of his life. He was committed to not waste a minute. He was com it was a commitment he made the minute he determined to serve the mission. His commitment ratcheted up when his congregation stepped up to help finance his mission expenses. Reality hit quickly and it hit hard, Steve recalls. I remember my first week in my first area. I was in Leighton Buzzard, a little village about 50 miles north of London. It looked like somebody had rolled the clock back 200 years. I was thousands of miles from, away from my home, my family, and anything that was familiar. I was tired. I was overwhelmed. I was scared. I was homesick. I was lonely. I was experiencing major culture shock. I remember kneeling down to pray and crying, but trying to hide it from my missionary companion. I didn't cover it very well because about 10 minutes later, he said, pray your heart out, elder, pray your heart out. Serving as a missionary for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is not easy, but it is simple. There is only one thing to do, share the gospel of Jesus Christ for 10 or 12 hours a day. Before the 10-hour shift of knocking on doors and talking to people begins, the missionary and his or her companions spend a couple of hours studying the scriptures and lessons they will teach. They have an allotted time for the routine parts of their life, like showering and meal prep. Most of Steve's meals consisted of Weetabix, cold cereal. Weetabix is like eating a piece of hay. That's, where, that's the best description of it, a small piece of hay. Why waste time on meal prep when there are people to teach and lives to change? This led some of his companions to call and beg the mission president to be transferred. This guy doesn't even stop to eat. Missionaries spend their days talking to people on the streets, walking up to complete strangers and starting a conversation out of the blue. And daunting, out of the blue was daunting for many missionaries, especially when they were new. Steve was in seventh heaven. He loved meeting people. He was never at a loss for something clever to say, fun, uh, clever or fun to say. He was talking the birds out of the trees. Missionaries also knocked on a lot of doors. This is called tracting. It can be hard. Missionaries got a lot of doors slammed in their face. This can be demoralizing. Steve had become inured to knocking on doors and rejection years before when he, was, he sold donuts and magazine subscriptions. This was no different, except now he had something much more valuable to offer. One, Steve, one day, Steve looked around at the town where he had been tracting, and he realized that missionaries have been tracting there since 1842. If he wanted somebody to listen to him, he better get creative. Steve and his companion, Paul Waite, knocked on a door. The woman who answered didn't even open the door. She flicked open the mail slot and said, we know who you are. We're not interested. Steve said, my name is Elder Hardison. What's your name? Doreen Crook, she responded. Is your husband home? Can we talk to him? Asked Steve. I'm ironing his trousers. He's not available. He's in the back room with his trousers down. You're telling me you have a crook in your house with his trousers down and you haven't called the police yet? Steve could hear the man laughing. Let them in, Mr. Crook said as he slipped on his pants. Steve baptized Mr. and Mrs. Crook and five of their seven children. I remember when this happened and that's exactly what happened. Steve loved missionary work, and he made it fun. Mission, missionaries and Steve's mission, which included London and its southern suburbs, tracked it in a lot of apartment buildings. Sometimes Steve would have his companion walk up one flight of stairs above Steve. Steve would knock on the door, and when someone answered, he would say, we are here to tell you about a book from heaven. On, on that cue, his companion would drop the Book of Mormon, and he would land in Steve's hands. Every now and again, the book would hit Steve's glasses and knock them off kilter. Steve had fun, but never at the expense of working hard and working effectively. Scott Parker, who served with Steve in the England London South Mission, said Steve was the same height he is now, but take off about 40 or maybe 50 pounds. He was very skinny, not just lanky, but skinny on skinny, which is very true. But he was fearless. He was fun. He was funny. He was incredibly articulate. He was dynamic. He was hardworking. He was very diligent. There was no screwing around. There was no playtime. What happens when fearless, funny, and indefatigable, which means unlimited energy for those of you like me that didn't know what that word means, 
unite. Steve was far and away the most effective missionary I ever experienced, says Scott. He out found, out taught, out baptized everyone in the mission. One day, Steve and his companion met a woman named Julia Burgess. She was receptive and was later baptized. Years later, when Steve and Amy returned to England and visited Julia, their conversation turned to their first meeting. Julia asked, did I ever tell you the rest of the story? She hadn't. The night before Steve met Julia, she was sitting on her front porch smoking a cigarette. She was divorced and was raising two young boys. There wasn't enough money for the basic needs. Julie was exhausted and, and discouraged. It all seemed like too much. She groaned a prayer. God, if you're there, you're going to have to tell me. You're going to have to help me. Otherwise, I'm going to end it all. Steve and his companion knocked on her door the next morning. When she answered, they told her they had a message from God. Steve's two years were filled with experiences like these. These years were a period of intense growth. Steve drew close to God. He used and developed every talent he had. He found that the difficult events of his life had deepened his soul and enabled him to understand and empathize with people whose lives were difficult. Steve's talent were evident, and it wasn't long before Steve was given leadership positions. Steve served with two different mission presidents, Donald Livingston and Richard Iyer. Typically, mission presidents are mature men in their 50s or 60s. Donald Livingston was probably in his middle, middle to late 60s. Sometimes they're in their 40s. Richard Iyer was 31. Iyer was a Harvard-trained management consultant and a truly extraordinary man. After his three-year service as a mission president, Richard and his wife, Linda, wrote Teaching Your Children Values, which was the first uh, let's see, which was the first family and parenting book in 50 years since Dr. Spock to reach number one on the New York Times bestselling list. They were named by President Reagan in the 1980s to direct the White House Conference on Children and Parents. They've appeared on Oprah's television show. Richard Iyer exerted a powerful influence on Steve's life. Here are Richard and Linda's accounts of meeting Steve in their own words. Linda Iyer. Steve Hardison was the first smile I saw as we disembarked from our long flight to London with our four little children, age five and under. We had flown through the night from Salt Lake City, and I was bleary-eyed and exhausted. I had never dealt with jet lag, as this was my first overseas flight, and sparing the details, I will say it has not been a pleasant experience. With four needy preschoolers in tow and a husband excited for the task ahead, even though he was only about 10 years older than many of the missionaries, I must admit to being a bit daunting, daunted. I must admit to being, to being a bit daunted. I was about to be a mission mom to 200 young missionaries, which for starters meant learning their names, a little about their families, their hometowns, and a bit about their lives, as well as learning to run a new home which involved feeding multitudes of missionaries and dignitaries. The beaming smile of Steve saved me that day. He was so kind and encouraging to me while engaging so enthusiastically with our kids. Richard Iyer. We were young ourselves at the time. I was 31 and Linda was 28. Our flight was met by two assistants to the mission president, the two top leaders of the 200 missionaries serving in the south of England. Their names were Glenn Foreman and Steve Hardison. While they had been chosen by my predecessor, it quickly became apparent to me that they would have been my selections as well. Steve was the younger of the two, just 21 years old, and was in the final months of his missionary service. He had the respect and allegiance of the missionaries he led, particularly the middle management of the mission, mission's district leaders and zone leaders. He also knew all of the missionaries and had perceptive and accurate opinions and assessments of their abilities and of their strengths and weaknesses. I leaned a lot on Steve and on his knowledge and insights. I felt like he had particular gifts in listening and evaluating. This not only helped him lead the mission, it made him a good teacher, assistant, and counselor, far beyond his years and his maturity, responsibilities, and abil abilities. It was clear even then that he was more interested in people and in helping others succeed than in compiling personal accomplishments and accolades. Steve brought all his focus, intensity, and passion to his missionary work. 
He never squandered a minute. His dedication was total and complete. Every day of his mission, he prayed, God, I am giving everything I've got. Every day I'm teaching people about eternal families. Please, when I get home, help me find someone I can create a loving and eternal family with. Boom. <laughs> thank you, Scott. Thank you, uh, Becky. And thank you, Carol, for the reading today. But I'm going to have to say this, Scott, all right? Um, and you had a little bit of fun. And I remember reading in, this, in another chapter how Steve is a prankster. And he, he and another buddy would like to do little tricks on each other here. And I think tonight, since this is going to be seen all over the world, you pay, played the ultimate, ultimate uh, joke on him tonight. And I cannot wait to find out his reaction after he listens to this here. And we're going to name this probably the fart heard around the world. So thank you for sharing that with us here tonight. So <laughs> that was awesome. Totally awesome. So yeah. thank you. Yeah. Uh, oh, this is a... Uh, Becky, I'm talking directly to you right now. Since this is your first time tonight, uh, we ask uh, those who read that, you know, they read for themselves and we get the listeners listen for themselves. And at the end of each reading, we go back to the readers and we like to ask the question, um, would you like to share with the rest of us what came up for you while you read the back of the book? If there's anything that came up there, would you like to share with us? Uh, thank you, Ken. I think, um, I mean, it, you can't read it quickly like I did. You know, I mean, I think it's like one statement at a time just re requires such an internal discovery process. Um, so I, I, what came up for me is I need to go back and, and, and do that again because it's changing all the time. I also just completed my first big, giant, long batch of, um, of time with Steve and what you just read, Scott, is reminding me about Steve's ability to listen because, I mean, he's just such a good listener. And in his presence, you know, you can feel it that he doesn't have an agenda. He's not, he doesn't have a program. He's just like being so present. And I think that means so much. It means so much to me. And um, I'm going to, I'm going to think about that a lot and also the back of the book and just because you can read it again and again and it means something different every time thank you for asking that well becky you're absolutely right and that's what the purpose of reading the book in the back and the front every time you pick it up you set it down you pick it up and you said it is to remind you that you know we're not reading about steve hardison yeah it's all about him but you're supposed to immerse yourself into that you know, when I first read the book, I did the same thing, you know, uh, okay, let's learn about this guy, who he's all about. But as you continue to read with it, matter of fact, I, uh, my dear Tanya is on, on the call tonight. I did it by I, audio at first. And I remember having a call with her and she said, uh, you know, have you read it? And I said, yeah, I listened to it. She goes by audio. And I said, yes. Yeah. She goes, no, 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 dear. You need to go and buy this book and you need to immerse yourself into it. But when I do, every time I, I go back and I read the, the back of the book and the front of the book, that grounds me. That mm -hmm. grounds me and prepares me to listen. I see what's going to come up here. Yeah, I see Steve. And when it grounds me, I can see a lot of things that are really in my life that it, it, with the whole purpose of this book, don't read it about him, read it about me and how I am being or what I was and what I want to continue to be. And you know, another thing I want to uh, bring up here, Becky, is that you've mentioned about how you think Steve is so immaculate in listening. We all going through a whole life, we learn not to listen. We, yeah. we learn to tell, we learn to have the people to understand us and we're not there for anybody else. Listening to me in my life is the most important part about a communication. And I'm glad you brought that up. And I feel and I sense that's a big part in your life that you are trying or you are on the road to learning how to be present and how to be listening. So thank you so, so much for sharing that with us here tonight. I really, really appreciate you. Thank you. Carol, uh, the screen jumped all over the place here. So I do not know where you are. Raise your hand for me. I, I, I can't, I don't, are you here? Oh, there you are. All right, thank you. All right, Carol, would you like to share what came up for you, uh, what you felt or what your thoughts are about the first two pages?
Yes, thank you, Ken. Tonight, just before I got on this call, I was on a call with one of my sons and really and truly when I began to read this in the very first question of who am I being as a partner or parent or friend and with my with my son who is challenged with health issues and also challenged in going through a separation and divorce at this time for me it's being that that nurturer and a friend, but being very careful in what that means because I'm there as support and as a parent and as a listener and truly, truly um, listening deeply. And he called me tonight because obviously he had been thinking about our conversation on the weekend. And he said, there's something I want to talk to you about because when we spoke on the weekend, mom, you asked me a question and that question was would I want to get back together again with Joanne and he said I don't know if you know this or not but as we talked in that conversation you used the word ego 10 times and he said I've certainly thought about that since, since we last talked. And he said, my answer to you is that for us to get back together, we would both have to leave our egos at the door. So, you know, I then put my hand up to read tonight. And I just, you know, as the title says, before you begin. For each and every one of us, we live from our hearts, but truly the message for me is always put your ego by the door. Mm. Thank you. Carol, fantastic. Um, what I heard out of this whole thing was, well, with the insight that happened for me listening to that was that your son listened to you. He actually counted how many times you used the word ego. So that must tell you how much he was listening to the conversation, how present he was to you about that. And not only that, he, he, he dropped his ego in the co second conversation with the let, let, let you know that it's not just her, it's me as well. And we both need to work on that. So thank you for sharing that, that very, very powerful story. And thank you for being vulnerable to read this and then share that also with every one of us here and I'm taking that to heart so and that's one important thing that I'm always learning it about is making sure it's not about me whoever I am in the present you mentioned something about um uh you know as uh, what came up for you as being a parent you're nurturing and you know you have this son who's you know health issues and everything like that and I remember <laughs> I remember my wife's father wound up getting dementia and he lived 25 miles away which she felt compelled to take it upon herself among seven other brothers and sisters she's the youngest person and bring him to our house every single weekend just to have somebody there with him and it used to drive me crazy to have this man repeat over and over and over and over again the same thing and I couldn't wait to take him back home that was the old me I wish this book was out then so I can learn how to be with somebody and the being for me would been how to support my wife who is supporting her father. Yeah, now listen, I can sit here in guilt. I can live my life in guilt because of that, but I don't. I, listen, I look at it as a lesson for whoever I'm in front of now, whoever I'm with here is that I am there for them and it's not about me. No matter how much it might seem that it's crazy to me, but it's not about that. It's my love for them. And I've learned a lot. So Carol, thank you so much for sharing that because that instantly brought out that story about me. Mr. Scott, okay. I know when you read, 
you read in the you started in the beginning. You shared a little bit about you and Steve, and um, you started to mention that. But I'm going to ask you, Scott, as you read this, was there something that came up for you personally that you would like to share? Yeah. Um, the thing about Steve um, that I gained, and it reading this i remember i remember some very distinctive things that happened but the thing about steve as a missionary was he had this tenaciousness and this work ethic that was very rare and but he was very very kind he was always very kind and he was very patient and he was very loving i remember one time we were walking up on a a doorstep and there was a bug walking across the sidewalk and I was going to kill it, you know, get it out of the way. And Steve, Steve said, don't, 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 don't. And he went over and picked it up and put it in the flower bed, got it off the sidewalk and got it in the flower bed. And I've always remembered that. I've always remembered that. So, uh, you know, as I sit here and think about these years with him, these formative years that I had in our friendship and our relationship, it's it's amazing the things that come back. There was a there was a time in our mission that there was a I don't even know how to describe this, but there was a bit of a power struggle going on with some of the missionaries, and they were manipulating the the older mission president, President Livingston. And Steve got kind of involved in that in a way, and he got kind of taken a little bit along this path, and he exposed the whole thing to the mission president. And there was a lot of, there was just a lot of stuff that went on. It's hard to understand if you're not involved in it, but there was a lot of things that happened. And there were a lot of demotions that happened, if you will, uh, as a result of what happened. And Steve survived it. And uh, he, one time we were working over and he said to me, I want you to know exactly what happened. And so when we went to bed, we had these twin beds that we were sleeping in and he was in one and I was in one we were in the same room and he was telling me the whole story <laughs> and I was laying there listening and it was probably an over an hour that he was talking and every once in a while he'd say are you are you still awake are you, are you still with me and I'd say yeah yeah I'm listening yeah I'm I'm here and he told me the story because he said I want you because you're going to be here I want you to know what happened because there's a lot of people that are going to talk about this I want you to know exactly what happened. So, Steve, there's so many incredible attributes about him. And there's so many things from my relationship with him that I've learned about myself. And I think reading this book about you, you know, is not intuitive to do it that way. But I think that's the challenge is to 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 read it that way. And um uh, I, I just am grateful to have had this wonderful experience with him in my life and have had this period of time with him in my life. This is when our friendship and our relationship started. And there's never, there's never, well, can't say there's never been a break. There was a break in our relationship at one point, and there was a little bit of a divorce <laughs> and, uh, that's a whole nother story. But, um, uh, you know, we put that back together too. And, um, and, uh, anyway, that it was, thank you for allowing me to be here. This has been a wonderful experience for me. Thank you, Scott, for sharing that. And, uh, one thing that came up for me is about how Steve picked up the bug and, and moved. I lived that every single day through my wife. I mean, I swear to God, I told her if we're ever, if she's driving and, and she avoids, the, she'll kill herself, just avoid killing a bird. That's, that's just the way she is. You know, every little critter that's crawling around in our house. Now, don't take that wrong folks. I, I don't have a bunch of bugs and frogs and, and everything running around in my house. It's just that if she finds an ant or a spider or anything like that, get me the jar. And I have to run all the way upstairs, grab a jar for her to go out and take care of it. Because you know why, Scott? is because she sees Jesus in everything, believe it or not. 
I see God, I see beauty, I see nature. God created that per that bug for a reason here, and that's how she lives her life. And thank you for sharing that with us tonight. So thank you again to all your readers. So now at this time, I'd like to open up for anybody else to share that what it might came up for you during the readings or something else that you read. Dave. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. I want to share with you the, the parts, two things. Firstly, I'd like to invite you to take a look at this beautiful soul that's on Teen Tuck named Carrie Rickabaugh. I'm actually here because of a mission that Carrie Rickabaugh served in Salt Lake City a long time ago. You see, she helped a guy discover his faith in God. And because of that, I met that guy 15, 20 years later. And that's the guy who introduced me to TBLIT NFL and the world of Steve Hardison. And the point of this is that you do not know the impact that your service will have on the world. From a certain perspective, Everyone that has been blessed or has have, I've, I've had the opportunity to interact with or to know or to love or admire, even my present occupation may not have happened without the actions that Carrie took years and years ago. So Scott and Steve were missionaries in England the year that I was born. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and I now interact with people who are missionaries in my mission, who were born, you know, who were born back when I was on my mission. So the, the great legacy lives on, Scott. This is not okay. an, it's not any kind. This is All great right. love, man. <laughs> um, and you don't know where the ripples end. You know, I've never met Scott in person. Scott, I've never met you in person. I don't know if you know that, but we haven't yet had that oh, opportunity. I know that. <laughs> and yet the ripples that, that Scott makes has made by being interviewed for this book and has in the conversations I've I've seen and observed, and in the ways that I've seen how he interacts, how you interact, Scott, with other people, has made a difference in my life. Mm. And um And I could tell stories like that about almost everybody on this call. You know, Becky Robbins, David Block, Penny Earl, Orton, my wife, Renata, and uh, Wolfgang. And I'm not allowed to acknowledge, I know, I know, Tanya, I see that look in your eye. This is about me because... Each of the lives that touch mine for good is a reflection of the love of the divine, however that looks for you. And it allows me to see that as I am being loving and I'm surrounded by beings of lovingness, there is a divine weave in my life and you are part of it. Thank you. I love you. Love you too, Dave. Open it up to anybody else who would like to share what's coming up. Just sit with that for a few seconds and see what's coming up for you and share it. Remember, I said in the beginning here, you're in a safe place. You're in a non-judgmental place. You are in a place of love. Elaine. Um, when I look through the book, there is there's a lot of highlighted stuff like every chapter it's highlighted in various colors and for this particular chapter not very much is highlighted because I've always gone into it always and not I've read it about me but not really found anything about me in it and as I was listening today it occurred to me that my mission is my life and my book of Mormon is love and when we're coming from a place of love, 
we can often feel like doors are slamming in our face all the time. Um, and we, if, when we continue coming from that place, we find in the end that everything's always provided for us, that we can go through challenging times. We can feel, or I felt at times in my life that, and my, my dad would say to me, you need to harden up. You know, you're, you're gonna get hurt really, really badly. And I did get hurt really badly. And I, you know, had challenges because you come from that place. But what I've come to see is that when you continue coming from that place of love, essentially everything's provided for you. And those challenges, those doors slamming in your face become your lessons and they become my lessons. <laughs> Um, and have, have made me who I am today and only made my belief that coming from love is the only way to be whatever, whatever. Yeah, I'm, I'm complete. Thank you. Elaine, that was such an awesome share. Um, coming from a place of love, no matter what happened in your world, no matter what happened to you here, you're still stood up and you still shine and you still wound up being that light for everybody else that still did not find love. I couldn't do that either. I couldn't, others, except for my wife and my kids and that's, and my grandkids and my immediate family, I, I love you and that, you know, pick it in the, whatever. But this past March, I had an opportunity to speak in front of 75 people and my whole goal was to talk about the being. Who do you want to be? Who do you want to be? And the very first words out of my mouth, I stood up there, the microphone came in, and I looked at every 75 people that were there, and I said these words, I love you. I love each and every one of you. Now, here I am talking. I'm the keynote speaker. I'm talking to a bunch of professional management healthcare people and I say these three words and I say them for a purpose because I was emanating in my life at that time that I learned who I want to be it's not about the other person it's about who I want to be and how I want to show up a lot of times when I show up on calls or I show up in public I get excited I'm I'm rah rah I you know people ask me how are you Ken I'm fantastic and I'm truly that way why? Because that person who's asking me may not feel fantastic. And maybe my love will give them a reason to say, well, I want some of that. How do I get that? And I can sit there and tell every one of you to your face, I love you. I can walk into my church and say, I love you. And mean it and not just say words. I am the light that's in my document. I am the love and the light that shines for people that are still walking in their darkness. That's who I am. So thank you, Elaine, for sharing that. Andrea. You are the love, you are the light, Ken. Ooh, I felt that. Thank you. Um, so my question was, who would I need to be to step powerfully into my future? And uh, I, I heard the word commit, 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 serve, 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 commit, 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 and uh, take a stand, take a stand, um, not waste time. So you know how Steve eats apples, like the whole thing, and not wasting a minute eating, even eating. Um, so I'm, and the quality time remaining thing, um, so I figured I just celebrated my 57th birthday a couple of days ago. So I figure if I live to 88, then I've got like 11,307 days to go. And so I'm not going to waste any more time. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to step powerfully. Uh, and uh, yeah, by committing. So that's what I heard was to commit and stand, take a stand for love. And kindness and uh, and about the mm, about the valuable offer. So I have I have a valuable offering, and I I wasn't seeing it before. I wasn't seeing my gifts before, 
And so that Steve was fearless and funny and indefatigable, however you say that. Um, and he had that smile. I've got gifts too. And I think I'm finally kind of embracing that, yeah, I, 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 have, I have gifts. And um, and the the final th story was um, yesterday was Mental Health World Mental Health Day, and I just I just uh, found that out. And uh, so the story about Julia, uh, you know, we never know who we're going to impact, and uh, and and uh, we just show up. We just show up in kindness. Um, and so I had my Julia um, uh, that, uh, yeah, he, he um, I, I just, I just heard his, his call and I just, I just was kind and, uh, and in fact, it did have a, I believe an impact may, may have saved his life. So I, I, I really um, oh, and also, um, you know, uh, the Dalai Lama said, um, my religion is simple. It's my religion is kindness. So it, it's, um, it's about using everything I've got um, that I have, like open my gifts and, and, and offer it, offer it, uh, you know, generously and not, and just come from, from that. And um, so that's what I, what I'm committed to doing with my quality time remaining. And I love you guys all. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea, for your vulnerability. But I just want to say one thing. You said some beautiful things in here that I'm, I'm, I'm stepping on. I know I had these gifts and I got gifts here. And you said these words, I'm kind of finally embracing it. And I challenge you, Andrea, to sit here after you leave this call tonight, not even right here. You're not kind of doing anything. You are it. You are powerful. You are loving. You are kind. And you know what? You commit it to being the best person that you can be. And it showed here tonight. I love you, girl. So thank you so much. Daniel. Thank you, Ken. Thank you, Scott. I appreciated your reading. Um, the it's interesting. Every, every time I'm here, uh, several times I don't necessarily feel at first like I have something to share. Um, though, if I sit with it a little bit, something new comes to me, and that's kind of what um, what popped to me today is I just had an insight when I was in high school, I was really confused about religion. And so I was like, I kind of had something against all kinds of religion. Um, and, and yet at the end of high school, I got a job. This will connect in a second. It may seem disparate at first. I got a job selling stereos uh, and TVs and stuff, Circuit City. And I had never done anything sales related before, though somehow I found out I was really good at it. And I was actually able to pay for college that way. Um, and, and part of what I realized is I was good at it because I just, I love that tech stuff and the stereos and the TV it was all really fun and interesting to me. And I, and I love serving people with that. And then years later, when I got into teaching and coaching um, and, and still when I was a much younger man, I was really, uh, I, I could, I didn't want to sell myself like, and that's what, what it was to me. It was like selling myself. So I really backed away from that. And I, and it, you know, and, and I think I minimized a lot what I could do. I, I still did well in my work, but it wasn't, it was despite my lack of quote sales. Um, and something that's shifted for me since, since the first time I read the book of being is, you know, what used to be sort of a concept for me as a, as a, as a teacher and coach, which is what's, well, it's not about me. It's the person 
that I'm serving that went from, from conceptual through, through Steve's modeling of the way he works, as I understood it from the book, went from conceptual into like a, a physical kinesthetic kind of experience for me. And since then my own work has changed in, and it continues to change to be feel like it's so much about just this like, animated excitement about the life of the person in front of me and especially their their purpose their destiny and their potential and so what i've been finding is i don't know if i would say i'm on a mission though when when i talk to someone who's got a a challenge or there's something they want to work on i find this um uh, almost as like zealotry in me, like, oh, come on, let's go, let's, let's get into it. And um, yeah, it's, it's like, it's a, it's a very cool shift that's happened where it's like, I don't feel like it's about me. So somehow it's easier to put myself forward in a way. I don't know if that totally makes sense. Uh, if it's coming across clear for me, it's uh, it, it's a cool distinction. And I didn't actually realize it until uh, until this call today. So awesome bonus part of it. Thanks for listening, y'all. I am complete. Awesome share, Daniel. Awesome share. And, and, and what I loved what you just said here is I read the, oh, and I read this today, you found what I heard is I had this tremendous insight and you shared it with us, what that insight was coming up for you here. So thank you for sharing that with all of us. Uh, and Marie, my woman, how you doing? Oh my gosh, how am I doing? I am so, so doing it. So um, I love this group because with this group, love is all there is. And I was growing up with so much hatred in my family that it was actually a food group and it put on a lot of weight more than carbohydrates. I mean, such an emotional weight that hatred puts on when it's actually your diet, right? And here we were going to church every Sunday, kneeling around the bed, the family that prays together stays together. Unfortunately, they were spelling it with an E and not an A. So it was like really violent. And, um, you know, and so here it is, I'm in this lawsuit with my three brothers Shut up. and there's hate. And, you know, I'm going to have to see these. Well, there's no hate on me because of this group. It's really tempered me. And it's made me so humble to love myself and have so much compassion for myself that that's all I can have for other people. For instance, um, you know, I can walk away, but these are my brothers and I'm going to see them at funerals and I'm going to see them at family events. And, and I saw them one year after my father died, and I hadn't spoken to them in a year, their choice. And I hugged them all, and my daughter was surprised. Why did you do that? And, and this is what's going to happen in the future as well. And I said, I don't know when I'm ever seeing them again alive. So every single time I see my brothers, even in their hatred for me, I am just going to love them because they are my brothers, and I do not know when I'm ever going to see them alive. You know. And so I hold that and also getting a divorce from my very best friend of 40 years, you know, and also that love for him. You know, I saw him in a in a room full of people and just saw how many people loved, honored and respected him, except me. And I'm the one who took a vow before God and man to do just that. And I had to put myself in check. And, and here it is, you know, pointing fingers, blame and shame, getting divorced. Why didn't it work? And I'm like, dude, I dropped the ball. Like, I'm so sorry, right? And how much more am I going to love you from that? You know, but because I was raised in a family of hatred um, and very Catholic and devout. I mean, I've got relatives and with the Pope. We've got cardinals in the family and stuff. It's like very Catholic. And, um, but I couldn't believe in God. And when you can't believe in God, it's very, very hard to believe in yourself until I realized that God isn't within us waiting to come out. God is not in the world waiting for an invitation to join our life. God is in our heart waiting for an invitation to come out into our lives. And so that is where the self-love 
the compassion for myself exudes like everybody. And like I quote all the time, Mother Teresa and a man was alive being eaten by rats on the streets of Calcutta. And she said, bring him home. She learned, looked at the novices and take this man home. And the interviewer said, why do you help everyone? And she says, I help no one. Jesus did not tell me to help. Jesus told me to love. I'm loving them. And the only way we can do that is charity begins at home. Home is where the heart is. Love yourself. Thank you. I'm complete. <laughs> wow. Wow. That was awesome. That is what came up for me about that here is, is I remember Steve telling a story and I shared this. I don't know with this group, but I'll share uh, or another group, but I'll share it again. He was telling a story about a, a person he was coaching and, and this person got really, really angry at him and, you know, threatened his memory. That was a powerful share. And, and, and what uh, was tell, what came when I was sharing that here is Steve was still telling a man that he loves him, knowing that he's going to be killed by him right then and there, you know? So that's the way we need to live our lives. That's what I had to learn. I'm still going through that process right now with myself, uh, learning about bringing God into my life, which I kicked him out all of it because I shared my story, as you know, that where was God when he when I was getting kicked in the head by my mother? You know, where was he when I was getting abused and, and all that stuff here? And I didn't, and there was no God, but I learned to accept it. And, and what by doing that, by opening up, by letting them come into my heart, it's opening up other things in my life about God that I don't wasn't even know, I don't even know about. It's just automatically coming here. You know, I'm sharing it with people that we're talking about Jesus, we're sharing the Bible scriptures, and I had beautiful conversations with Teresa today. We had a wonderful, powerful connection with one-on-one and, you know, what she shared with me about Jesus. And so I was very uncomfortable with that in, uh, two years ago. I couldn't talk about it. You want to talk about God? Let's change the conversation. That's how I was. But you're right. As I said in the beginning, God is unconditional, pure love. And we, he created us to be that way. And we need to be that way. So thank you so much, Anne-Marie. Thank, thank you for sharing it. So uh terry yes hello uh, what many of you don't know is that i don't like to public speak so but you've been hearing a lot about me so i'm getting over that um and many of you know that i am recreating my life after my husband died in january and it seems like there's just all kinds of crazy things and and i noticed that at first and in, in his missionary or mission process that he was a little nervous, which I'm sure all of you guys were uh, originally, and he, st and he stepped into it. Um, and today I was on a call, and what I want you to know is that almost, no, every single day, something is brought to me that is is aiding me in this creation of my new life. And today I was on a, on a call with doing EFT, which is tapping and calming your emotions and so on. And I was taking all of these notes. And I realized that it's been several months that I'm using a bunch of pens that I that keep skipping. And I'm going, wait a minute, let's go in the other room and see if I can find a pen. And so I actually went into Robert's room and there he had a whole bunch of pens. And, and in the front of it, is this sign, which I had never seen before in 23 years. It says, life is simple and easy. You, you probably can't see it here, but it's got a little, a little um, horse and, um, and rider and says, life is simple and easy. I grabbed a couple of his pens, took them in the other room and they were worked beautifully. And then as today, as I was listening to you guys and thinking, oh, I want to share this, that life is simple and easy. I recognize that all day long, my internet connection has been horrible and it kept cutting out. And I'm going, how am I going to share this? And then I thought, you know, it's only been, it's only been um, a couple of months that, that you were able to use your computer without the connecting it by wire. Before, for a while, I had to connect it with the wire, and I thought, okay, the wire's still there. I'm going to go and connect it. Then I'm not going to have to worry about whether my, my internet's going to go away with you guys. And so that's exactly what I did. Life is simple and easy. That's what I wanted to share tonight.
Perry, I'm just going to leave that where it lays right now, but say this one comment to you. In the beginning, you said, guys, you know, I do not like public speaking. I <laughs> would not know the difference of what you just shared with every single one of us here. And we all felt you. So this fear of not public speaking, it just went behind you. Thank you <laughs> so much for sharing that because you came through. Everything about you came through. You shared this some of your story last week about your husband. And I'm going to leave it just right there so we all can marinate it on it. So thank you so, so much. All right. So I do not see. Let me check the other page. I don't see anybody else raising their hand. I'll give it one last ask. Is there anybody else that would like to share before we move on? I thank all of our readers here tonight. I thank all of the all of you who shared. I've had so many insights off these conversations that everybody shared. So thank you from the bottom of my heart for being here. Becky and Tanja, thank you for being here for the first time. And we welcome you back every single time on Sundays and on Wednesday evenings. You are amongst family. This is your community just as much as it, it is ours. So at this time, I'd like to turn it over to our very own Miss Farry. Thank you, Chen. What a night. What great readers. Thank you so much, Carol. Wonderful Scott Parker and a divine Becky. Thank you so much for making our evening so much nicer. And the book that has gotten us all together is not just ending here. It's expanding on, on the podcast, on the YouTube, on the LinkedIn and now with the events that we have in Arizona in January um, 26, if I'm remembering it well, and um, also the huge one that is going to be in um, Birmingham, Birmingham um, England, um, May of 2024. And uh, I so highly recommend and invite you all to just expand yourself for more love and knowledge that is there for all of us to become more than that. It's by reading the book that we're reading it. I mean, think about it. Every line on this, the back of the book that it says, dear potential reader, every time I get pissed and mad and angry and all of that, I just go on and then it says, who would I need to be to be at peace with who I am? And boom, a word as big as ego comes here right in front of my eyes. And I said, that is me. And how do I drop that? How do I sink in within me? And I never used to ask that question because, of course, I'm flawless. And, of course, there's nothing wrong with me ever. And that's what we all feel, isn't it? To go to that book and have these unbelievable moments awareness awakening our moment and this is only so little of us here tonight imagine when you go to the events when you go and listen to the podcast when you go to the linkedin um instagram but god bless eric lofham i love that man to create this and it's expanding and it's and it's expanding and it's expanding and look at how big it's getting and uh, of course, we love our Steve Hardison and we respect and adore Amy Hardison. Sure, without a doubt, Alan D. Thompson doing such a great work. But this is a brilliant space that it brings us together so we can say, OK, let's grow. Let's learn. Let's give our shoulders to each other to lean on and make our place, our lives a better place by just being a support for somebody. So I hope you've gotten as much as I got from tonight. And I hope you get your books and you read more the back and the front each time you read it. And with that, I think I said it all. If I've left anything behind, remind me. If not, Miss Tanya, um, anything else need to be said? Otherwise, we can all unmute and we have the after party so it'll be not recorded that if anybody likes to come and talk and share it would not be recorded is literally you're in the house of the book reading and it's all safe and secure you're welcome to stay otherwise you're all welcome to unmute and send love for each other 
And hopefully we see you next time. We have it on Sunday morning at 7 a.m. Pacific and 10 a.m. Easter time. And then next Wednesday, the same here. So next Sunday, our readers are our two lovebirds. They're reading, meeting the Amy chapter eight. And sadly, I cannot be here because of my hubby he wants me to be with him on Sunday morning. But you guys can be, and you can all see, and I'll see the recording. But please show up. Having said that, I think I'm going to come because I want to see this love bed reading. <laughs> I'll give breakfast to Javier and that I'll be here. But I just love to see these two that they met on the Ultimate Coach Facebook, Pennsylvania, Scotland. Go figure that out. So it's a place of love for everything in each and every way. So please show up. Lesson, learn, talk about yourself, speak about yourself, and let's make this place to be a much bigger place of a place of love. So let's say, I love you all. Thank you. Unmute. Let's go on. Love you all. Have a good night. Bye. 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 Bye.